Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Mycorrhizae, Bring Value to Your Cannabis Plants. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. Today's webinar will help you understand how a good mycorrhizae product can enhance the value of your plant's roots, translating into higher cannabinoids, increased yields, and shorter veg time. With speakers from Purple Farm Genetics, a Canadian licensed producer, and ProMix, a company that provides commercial growers and consumers with cutting edge growing media products, we will elaborate on the properties of mycorrhizae and the technology behind it. We will also use this time to explain how your plants can achieve higher performance through active ingredients and precisely selected components. Today's speakers are Bernard Brito, the Market Development Director at Premier Tech Growers and Consumers, Matthias Plord, Market Specialist on the Medicinal Side at Premier Tech Growers and Consumers, and Mitchell L. Sweetie, President and Master Grower at Purple Farm Genetics. Uh, before we begin today's panel discussion here, just a few quick notes. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a uh, little Q&A icon. If you click that, that'll open up a Q&A box. Please feel free to type in your questions as the conversation goes on. At the end of today's webinar, we're going to be doing a little Q&A session, and we'll make sure to get to as many questions as possible. Also know that we are recording today's session. Uh, so if you have to leave at any time, that's fine. Uh, we will be sending out a copy of this webinar to all registrants via email in the next day or so. Uh, and now I'd like to sort of set the stage and begin our conversation. Uh, I want to get a sense uh, sort of, of, of who the three of you are, of course, but also how you started working together. Um, and I figure maybe Mitch, we can begin with you. Sure. My name is Mitch from uh, Purple Farm Genetics, founder and the master grower. Um, me and Bernard had a mutual friend who's a huge distributor of fertilizer in Canada. His name is Jeffrey Cuffley from Northern Lights. And um, they were mutual friends and we're all pretty much mutual friends. And we got introduced together and uh, we always wanted to uh, look for partners to work with. And it just seemed like a great fit considering I've been using uh, Premier Tech Promix products uh, since I started growing cannabis. And it just seemed like a great fit between the two groups and we met and their relationship kicked off. We, uh, if I can add on that as well, we, uh, <clears throat> when we were introduced, like Mitch mentioned, he was already using Promix. Um, I, w I knew he, uh, the way the facility was going in the, uh, at Purple Fire Genetics. So I really wanted to, uh, to be able to access plants to, to, to show the, the, the benefits of our product. So uh, it was really good because Mitch had all the experience uh, you know, the experience from many years and it was nice to have a facility that you know was up to scale and you know at, at, as far as technology goes was really really a, a nice facility a very nice place to work with and on my end i've joined the bernard team two years and a half ago uh and at that time a big challenge that we had uh, is to get data on uh, the performance of our product specifically on cannabis uh, so that, at that time, I got introduced to Mitch, who was our primary, I would say, collaborator on demonstration and trials, and still to this day with Purple Farm Genetics, uh, I would say is our primary uh, place where we do demonstration and trials on the Promix product. Excellent. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about the results of that uh, later on in this discussion, for sure, and, and some of the, the ROI that can be gleaned from products like this. Um, but to further set the table for our conversation, um, uh, maybe we can begin with Bernard here. Can you sort of just define mycorrhizae and how it is used uh, in, in the context of cannabis? Sure. So um, first off, our, our products, we have our growing media at, Pro, at Premier at Promix in the Promix line. Uh, we already use the mycorrhizae. So mycorrhizae at the basis is a, is a fungus. So that's why you hear myco for fungus and rhizae for, for root. So that's kind of, the, and it's a symbiotic uh, association between the roots and the fungi. Uh, or down the line there, Matthias is going to go a little bit more into depth there on the technical part, but basically the, the fungi or the, the spore needs to germinate and uh, attaches to the main root system of the plant. So either cannabis or any other, other plant, that's the way that it functions. So the spore to live has to live with the root to, to be able to, to, uh, to get the most out of it. Uh, when I kind of started to work in the in the industry, I, I saw that you know we cater a lot of crops, a lot of markets, but the specifically to cannabis, uh, the the crop is sh fairly short, 
in time. So uh, the idea was to bring the mycorrhizae because the mycorrhizae brings the, the best out of the plant when it's added at the earlier stage because you're able to benefit all through the all through the veg and the flowering phases. So the earlier the better. And I've seen an opportunity there because you were dealing with a plant that has a high value and you know you want a good return on investment for what what, what you add on. So the idea was to really get that early as a standalone, because like I mentioned, we have mycorrhizae in our, our growing media, but as a standalone to really kick it up earlier, that was kind of the goal of why we introduced that in the in the industry. So that's where we basically started with the Promise Connect, you know, uh, like Bernard mentioned, we already have mycorrhizae in our, our growing media, but at a fairly low concentration. And it's really good for any type of crop, but cannabis is such a short crop that we designed the Promise Connect specifically for cannabis to perform uh, on a certain way. Uh, and just give me a couple of seconds, I'm gonna start the presentation just to uh, showcase all of that. Um, so right from the get-go, just a, a quick video on the Promise Connect, uh, actually starring uh, Mitchell. Uh, you know, it's a, a product that has been designed as a wettable powder uh, to use when you're transplanting your rooted clone into a bigger pot. And the sooner the transplantation, the sooner the application, the better the results. The goal here is to create an IFI network, you know, an underground connection uh, to enhance the performance of the plant. And here you have a couple of shots showcasing the trials and the demonstration that we've done uh, the past few years in co collaboration with Purple Farm Genetics. And all these tests, you know, we've, we've even when we start this, it's really a, uh, we don't, when you, when you get some data and we're going to go a little bit more into depth there, but the, it's really important to have statistical data that you're able to give to the industry. So not just, you know, a couple of plants. It's really a random, a randomized amount of plants that we use. It's under the, uh, you know, making sure that we're able to to pull the good data out of it. So it was really fun with Mitch to to work together to be able to, you know, if we're for example, a room has 500 plants, we'll take maybe 200 plants and really pull some data out of that in a full room almost. So that was a good opportunity uh, with with Purple Farm. Yeah, exactly. Um... And as Bernard mentioned just earlier, uh, mycorrhizae actually is the symbiosis between a mycorrhizal fungi and the root system of a plant, in that case being, uh, being cannabis. Uh, but the main challenge here uh, for the industry is cannabis is a very, very short crop. Uh, so it's not the average mycorrhizal in Auckland that's going to perform well on cannabis because to be efficient, uh, the product need at least to be three things. It need to be viable, it need to be concentrated, and it also need to be close. Uh, when I say viable, uh, what I mean is uh, it's an alive microorganism, right? It's a fungi. So it needs to be alive in order to perform. So that's the first thing that you should look for. And inside our product, it's 100% viable spores that are produced in a laboratory aseptic conditions. So you're sure to, to having the, the highest quality, quality of the mycorrhizal fungi. And then come the concentration. So a 6,000 viable spores is, is the product that by far the most concentrated uh, in the market. Uh, and having a higher concentration, you're having a faster and stronger connection with the root system of a plant, which is essential with a short crop like cannabis. And the last one, close, uh, that's why we've designed the product as a wettable powder. Uh, it can also be used as a, a powder directly on the root system, but we recommend to use it as a wettable powder because as you can see on those pictures, you know, the, the spore is gonna get directly in contact with the roots. And that's what you want uh, in order for the symbiosis to get going uh, quickly. Just to give you an idea, like a clone like that would probably have close to 30,000 viable spores on that one unique point of contact. So that's a lot of viable spores, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, surface area around the, the root ball itself. Yeah, I think um, those are three words that we can certainly continue to come back to, viable, concentrated, and close. Um, I wanna sort of linger on that for a moment. And just, again, it's already been mentioned and it was in that video uh, with you, Mitch, um, the actual use of this product uh, it, it's very important to, to, I guess, implement it at the point of transplant. So Mitch, could you talk briefly about um, how that, maybe elaborate on how that works and how you included it in your workflow? Yeah, you know, essentially once 
you know, roots are present after cloning between 10 and 14 days. It's at that point when we want to inoculate, the sooner the better, because we all know that we're trying to create that symbiotic effect as fast as possible. So we inoculate, second we take them out of the cloning trays into their new transferred pot, um, and we hit the ground uh, running from there. So starting using mycorrhizae as soon as you can is highly recommended, and that's how we use it in our workflow. Every time we're transplanting from clone to its first pot, some people transfer once, some people transfer twice throughout their growing cycle. We transfer twice and we use it only in the first uh, transplant. You could use it in the second as well, uh, but we see um, sufficient results in our first transplant. Excellent. And um, again, I know we had a visual element there, but and maybe we can go back to Bernard for this one, but could you talk a bit about the different growing media and whether this type of product might apply to whether it's soil or cocoa or what have you? Yeah, so like, as you probably know, Promix, you know, we manufacture our peat moss company. Uh, we also amend, uh, we also add other uh, raw materials. Uh, so yes, we've done a lot of tests, uh, obviously with, with, with Promix, our growing media, but it was also done as well with uh, cocoa, straight cocoa, also with raw coal uh, as well. Uh, so, Yes, you know, it can be used through all pretty much all types of growing media. Uh, yeah, the basically the mycorrhizae only need the root system to live off and a physical support to develop. So peat-based growing media, cocoa-based growing media, and rock wool uh, work re real fine. Mm -hmm. um, the other word that, of course, I think we'll be picking up on several times in this presentation is uh, symbiosis, which is a very critical part of, of this process. Um, you know, I think uh, the audience and us probably have a basic understanding of what that word means. But in this context with mycorrhizae products and the cannabis root zone, um, Matthias, could you maybe elaborate a bit on what that word means and what, it, what it's really doing with the cannabis plant? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So in the industry, basically, uh, the mycorrhizae is usually renowned uh, for the, the IFE network and up. Uh, bringing more nutrients and water to the plant. And it's all true. Uh, but sometimes a couple of the steps of the establishment of that symbiosis isn't really talked about. Uh, and all of those steps ca can be divided in two phases. Uh, so the pre-symbiotic phases and the symbiotic phases. So when you apply the product uh, as a slurry, as you just uh, saw, uh, what actually happened uh, at, of, at your root system uh, first, the, the, the viable spores and the roots going to talk to each other. Uh, so, so that's going to uh, tell uh, the spores to germinate uh, towards the roots. And at that point, all of those spores, so those 30,000 viable spores, going to eventually make contact with the root system of a plant. Uh, and those two steps actually create a reaction from the plant. Those interactions actually stimulate the metabolism uh, of the cannabis plant. After that, we're starting more into the symbiotic phases. So uh, the IFE is going to actually penetrate the root cells and create structure like arboriscules. Uh, at that time, we say that the symbiosis uh, is, is now up and running because the fungi is able to exchange nutrients and water uh, for protein and sugar uh, from the plant uh, and is now able to develop itself uh, at the exterior of the root system. So creating the, the renowned IFE network of the plant, you know, uh, and so upcoming more nutrients and more water. Um, but at the same time, those physio physiological changes inside the plant also uh, affect how uh, cannabis, cannabis uh, can produce uh, compounds such as cannabinoids and terpenes. So yes, the uh, upcoming of nutrient and water, but also the changes in the stimulation of the root system uh, is a big deal when talking about mycorrhizae. Yeah, and um, with that in mind, again, those are, you know, the, the call, the contact, the connection, the completion. As we start getting into some of the results and, and what this really looks like, we're going to keep those four C's in mind. Um, the other one that I, I want to uh, maybe ask Bernard to elaborate a bit on is, is concentration. That really is an important part of, of this product, and especially with regard to how it works with cannabis. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on what what the concentration is in this product and, and why that's so important? Yeah. So, uh, like I, uh, I'll go ahead. So. 
like I said, uh, 6,000 viable spores. So the term here where it's important in terms of concentration is viable spores. Uh, because a lot of product are there, uh, out there, the concentration is in propagules. Uh, and it's not a bad word. Propagules is a real term in the industry. Uh, but uh, it stands for a part of the fungi that may eventually connect with the root system of a plant. But the fact is only viable spores have the capacity to efficiently colonize the root system of a plant. So you need of first to be, you need to be concentrated, but you need to be viable first. So I, uh, concentration of viable spores is the thing to look for. And Eric, just the amount, well, you know, again, it goes really towards the, the, the viability, but also the, the short, short part of that, that crop. So we kind of went pretty high or way high to make sure that that colonization is happening. And there's, you know, the points of surface, like I mentioned earlier, are there right there as you you do your transplant so that was just kind of that in the in the back idea and it also bring back to the four seas uh, the connection the stronger the connection between the fungi and the plant better is going to be eventually the benefits if you have six thousand vial spores the, the the point of connection between the fungi and the plant is going to be way higher if you're using a product with less concentration yeah and i uh just one more background question uh before we sort of start transferring into the results. Um, Bernard, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, what are some of the main differences between the use of mycorrhizae with cannabis and other crops? You know, we have some in the audience who, who have deep backgrounds in horticulture of all kinds. Um, are these products used in, with other crops and are there major differences that cannabis growers should be aware of specifically? Yeah. So for example, the, uh, the, 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 we use the Glomus Entrarad says, this is the strain we use. So, it's, I think it's 90% roughly, uh, you know, good on pretty much uh, all types of plants. Uh, we've really uh, took more the approach on, like we mentioned earlier, like the approach in, in terms of data was one thing to approach the market. Like I could have done it probably with tomatoes or cucumbers and we do do it. I mean, we have other crops at, 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 at the premiere that we, we cater the market, but uh, I really want to uh, have data on sp that specific plant. It gives us more credibility in the market as well but you're also able to talk the same language as your, your grower. Uh, so that was kind of where we wanted to make sure that we addressed this well and not talking about a other specific cross, but yes, the mycorrhiza itself is able to-, to, 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 uh, to but that There's other type of product, way. other type of mycorrhizae product with a lower concentration because some other plant are uh, having a way, way higher uh, cycle. So you're able to utilize a mycorrhizae product with a way lower concentration and still have the benefits. Uh, the key here is cannabis is a, a, a very short crop. So that's, uh, with, with that in mind, I promise Connect was, was actually designed. And, and there's still a lot of different type of plant that uh, actually, Bernard, you mentioned glomus and triradices. It's a, a endomycorrhizae, uh, but there's a type of plant that, example, like two mycorrhizae is going to colonize and can, cannabis doesn't work with like two mycorrhizae. So depending on the plant that you're using, you're looking to have the right mycorrhizae and also the right concentration for what you're looking for. So, so mm -hmm. just to add on Eric as well, you know, like for, for example, if it was a crop on a couple of years, probably we wouldn't, you know, promote maybe that type of high concentration and that value for that crop, because it's something that just, for example, in our growing media or somebody that would use a less concentrated mycorrhizae, would happen anyway because it will have the time to get there. The spore is going to be somewhere in, in, around the uh, the container or the growing media, and will eventually happen that that connection. But again, it goes down to the, the short short time you have. So, absolutely. And uh, and so yeah. Speaking of, of cannabis growers, of course, I wanted to turn to Mitch here and just get a sense from you, Mitch, of um, uh, your experience with mycorrhizae in general and um, what you were expecting from it and specifically uh, what your thought process was behind um, uh, beginning to use ProMix Connect. For example, I enjoyed that slide before with the four C's because um, once you inoculate, you're kind of like thinking, okay, when is this going to work? And eventually, you know, week one passes and week two passes and you start to see the reaction, what happens in your early veg stages throughout your late veg stages you start to see a robust growth in your root system and in your foliage. And that's when you start to really be, become excited about the effects of using 
uh, the mycorrhizae at such a high concentration. Um, you know, what, what starts to happen is that the plant starts to uptake more volume of feed. So you could continue feeding, for example, three liters every three days and out of nowhere within the first couple of weeks of inoculating your plant, it will start to uptake more. So you really got to pay attention to how much the plant is uptaking to keep up with the development of the root system. That's what we started to notice. We're like, okay, here's three liters. It, it gets dry pretty fast and we keep having to increase our volumes at a faster rate just to keep up with the root mass. Um, so that's the one thing we noticed in our early to late veg stages. And, you know, of course, uh, throughout the flowering stages, everything looked like it was going really fast. And, you know, when, of course, once you've har uh, harvested and collected the data, at that point, you're really able to see what the mycorrhizae did. You can look at your terpenes and cannabinoids and your yield, and you can see increases in all categories, which is just fantastic for us to see as a company, um, you know try to reduce our cogs, increase their yields. Um, the industry is very competitive, so we really want to increase those terpenes and cannabinoids and have consistent harvest batch after batch. And we, we just find we could rely on the connect to always keep us in that category, you know, and um, that's what we started to notice when we started to use this product. Yeah, and I definitely have a, a few questions that are going to be aimed at sure. um, yield and, and cannabinoids and terpenes like that. Uh, but uh, sort of dialing the clock back a little bit. I know you mentioned the veg stage and um, a very quickly growing, robust root zone development, foliage development. Um, could I take that to mean then that the veg stage in general becomes shorter and that this has an impact on time too? Absolutely. So what ends up happening is that uh, you end up shaving off substantial amount of time off of your veg. So for example, uh, it could be anywhere between five and seven, eight, nine days. And that's huge because within a year, you can almost obtain another cycle. Um, so like, you know, a year and a half you've obtained, depending on the cycles in your facility, shaving off a week is huge because that leads to an extra crop that, that you didn't think you were going to get, right? According to your cycle. So saving on veg time is absolutely huge in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and I know um, Matthias just put up some numbers here. Um, before diving into this, the other question I wanted to ask you, Mitch, was, you know, you mentioned the idea of feeding the plant properly and the fact that as you're using this product, um, things are moving faster and you've got to really pay attention. Could you just maybe elaborate on how, how the feeding process might change or, or what you were really looking for when it came time to, to feeding uh, feeding uh, the calendar, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so to you speak. know, again, it's it's keeping up with the root mass and you can't really see it because you're staring at a pot or whatever your, your growing media is and the volume is hitting like half the pot, right? And you have this root buildup that's happening at the bottom. So you always have to ensure that you're giving, that you're keeping up with the root mass buildup by giving heavier feedings. And every time you give those heavier feedings, you see it translate back into your plant. So. I, I just find using the mycorrhizae, you have to look at the overall development of your veg plant and keep up with the, uh, with the volumes of feedings and increasing them periodically to keep up. Or else you have root mass that's building up at the bottom that you're not really feeding, right? You're not paying attention to it. So having to test your plant, give it a heavier volume of feeding and see what happens and see if the plant can accept that or not. And that's how we play with the mycorrhizae. We give it that big uh, volume we back off, we see what happens to see if it can take it. And of course it just keeps taking, it keeps taking to the point where we, it's, it's hard to keep up with how fast the growth is and how fast the root development is. So we're, we're just pouring huge volumes of water into our growing media just to keep up with the root mass, which is huge because, you know, as the saying goes, it's cheesy, but the bigger the root, the bigger the fruit, right? And that's kind of the mentality here is um, our, our, our honey is made in our veg, not in our flower. So we focus on our veg heavily because once you enter flower, you, you just have that foundation already prepared to ensure you're gonna have that healthy yield, so. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. It, it goes back to just the underlying theme of, of observation and making sure you're aware of what's happening with the plants. Um, and I do wanna now 
fast forward the clock a little bit later in the production cycle toward harvest. I know Matthias had put up uh, some numbers there that certainly looked exciting. And we've been talking about increased yield and talking about increased uh, cannabinoids and terpenes in particular. So as you're getting closer to, to harvest, um, and, and we can sort of open this up to all three of you, but, but Mitch, what are you seeing there? And um, just visually, uh, how does this change the look of, of some of the plants that you're growing toward the end, I mean? Well, you should be able to see a slight, you know, cause it's, it's hard, right? You have a whole plot of plants and you're trying to see what's going on with them. You should be able to smell a, a increase of levels of terpenes, right? In the room, you, it, it just has that, that pungent, more of a pungent odor if you weren't to use this. You can see it's a little more frostier. Uh, your bud sites are bigger because you had a big root mass to start with, right? So um, these are some of the things that you can see is the uh, trichome development, terpene smell, the bud sizes are increased. These are all things that you'll notice near the end of harvest. But of course, all before that, you see your structure and your veg that has developed into your flower that just gives you that, that multi branch structure that you're trying to look for in your gardens, you know, and um, yeah, you know, have, having a, an overall strong plant. Uh, and at with, the end of the day, Ling well with what we present earlier, you know, uh, at its core, you have a stronger root system with the IF network providing more nutrients and more water. So your plant is going to be less than to react to stress. You're going to have probably a even more even canopy, uh, more brighter color to your plant. Uh, and that's going to translate to putting more mass quickly, having more nutrients, more water, you're going to grow a bigger plant. And then uh, when you're going to hit fl flowering, you know, having a bigger structure, having more energy, you're able to produce bigger buds. Um, and then at the end, what you're really looking for in my mind, what is the most important is higher quality. So you're able to consistently with mycorrhizae uh, push the production of those compounds. So, you know, cannabinoids and terpenes. Uh, and with the state of the market, it's a big, a big deal and a big difference for uh, any grower. And it's interesting because like what Mitch sees or smells or like all the data we have the support and, you know, not everybody, you know, will do a protocol, a testing protocol. Like there's some people will, that will grow, but when we get that feedback, just visually, uh, smell wise, all of these factors that a grower can actually see it, it's, 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 it's neat because, you know, we know, we understand the mycorrhizae, what it gives, what it does, but when somebody actually tells you, okay, I've seen it, I've smelled it, it's, it, it adds on there. So it really supports you. I mean, uh, the effect of having mycorrhizae in the, in the crop. It's so important for us as a company, because our mentality is, um, having a strong veg. That's where most of our success is. Um, so having that strong veg and having an additive like mycorrhizae uh, to support that mentality, um, that's, that's where most of our uh, success comes from is in our veg, building that foundation, um, leading into flower. So, And more and more growers, you can, when they see those effects, like for example, Mitch, well, you can't go without basically after that there because it's it's so much worth it you know you can't go without adding the, the mycorrhizae at that at that period so. yeah and, and of course um i know we've talked about some sensory details and uh you know i've got a, a couple broader questions to get to shortly but i i did want to hit on some of that data that you guys have done some research into increased yields um matthias i know uh you were bringing up a slide earlier that had some charts that um, i think would be really interesting to dig into so just between cannabinoid content or even just the mass itself, like we were just talking about, could you, could you describe some of the, the results that you have seen uh, with the product? Yeah, th that, that's actually one demonstration that we did uh, from multiple demonstration with Mitch. Um, back in the days, he was doing like a fairly long cycle of 114 days. So uh, moving on from clone to, clone to one gallon to 10 gallon. Um, so it was pretty much growing a massive, uh, very massive plant. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it used the, the product twice. So at two, two, two transplantations, so from the clone and also from the wrong gallon to 10 gallon. So it was basically investing $8 per plant. Uh, but, you know, when you're considering that you were able to pushing uh, 32 gram uh, plus per plant, uh, the return on investment just only there makes sense, you know, 21 for one. 
and that's not even uh, accounting for the five days reduction in veg uh, and the impact on the THC, which was able to crank up 1.5 points and the terpene profile. So you're having more, but also uh, better cannabis at the end of the day. So, so Eric, just to add on to the, once we do these kind of trials with growers, this is what we want to pull at the end. So, I mean, the, the, the samples, everything is done by the, the licensed producer. They send the samples. We're doing the amount that statistically we can provide the market to make sure we're okay with what we present here. So yes, we've done that with Purple Farm, but we've done that with many other, you know, growers as well. Uh, but this is really the idea of showing like sometimes like we took the time to show the in return investment because like Mitch told us be before that, I mean, in a room 10%, you won't maybe visually see the yield increase. So, but when you weigh plant per plant and we did that, I mean, it's a lot, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a couple of days of work and making Definitely. sure that everything is perfect. And you got Mitch that is really a uh, particular and everything. So, I mean, what, what, what's good is that we don't, you feel comfortable after that presenting numbers and you're okay to present it this, this to the industry because it, you know, it's, it's really a, something stable or something hard, hard, hard to present. So the trial protocol is super important because not everyone weighs, um, you know, 50 plants with microarrays and 50 plants without, and does the real comparison uh, with ProMix, Premier Tech, uh, they were able to really help us understand that and uh, the trial protocols were really uh, fun yeah and also just to mm -hmm. add on that because it's not everybody that has the chance as Mitchell have access to a big grow room and do some trials and demonstration you know uh, so you cannot all the time wait each plan you cannot always send samples to the lab to get those results no cannabinoids and terpenes uh, but the thing that you can look for is using a, a strain that you're really comfortable with, that you know the usual outcomes, uh, and then applying the mycorrhizae and see the differences, you know, is my bud frostier? Do my plan are bigger when I'm using the same size of, of, of pot? You know, those kind of things. So one of the recommendation is to use a strain that you're comfortable with and applying mycorrhizae and see the differences. But even when we did that, like, Mitch, for Mitch, Mitch grows his plants. I mean, it's under a really strict control and, and uh, environment. So we're still able to pull this off, like in getting those results. And we've seen just, just because we're talking other growers that we did some demonstration outdoor crops. And, you know, we've seen even more higher increase because you're outdoor, you're relying on, on mother nature, basically. So that's where the mycorrhizae even strives better because it's under, you know, under stress what you need to do is survive. To survive, you need to attach yourself on a root system. So that's even where the, the, the mycorrhizae really, really kicks in even better. So, um, but all that said is just that even in those very good conditions, we're able to get that type of data that really helps him in the industry to, to, to market his product, product to sell it. Uh, it's good. Certainly, yeah, especially just, uh, you know, the industry is only getting more competitive as time goes on, of course. Yes. Um, I had a quick question that, that occurred to me as that slide was up there, um, just relating to moving from clones to one gallon pots to 10 gallon pots. Um, should growers be thinking about bigger pots in general? And I'm just thinking about the, the robust root structure here, um, or is the one gallon to 10 gallon, is that a good uh, movement to keep in mind? It depends on the facility and the growth cycles. You know, of course, you don't want to be growing huge plants when you can have your uh, have a much quicker turnover by having more plants and smaller pots and repopulating faster. Nobody wants a 40 or 35 day veg. It's just, it's too long in a basic production facility. Um, but you don't want your pot also to be too small where you're not able to support that structure. Like I have fun and we enjoy um, having a multi-top branch plant where we're able to top and have multiple flowering sites where all of our yield is focused at the very top of the plant. And in order to achieve that, sometimes you need to have a prolonged veg period. So to me, my personal preference would be anywhere between, um, you know, 21 to 28 days of veg, and that's from clone. Um, to me, that's adequate. I love the structure that can produce out of something like this. Uh, some people will only have two weeks of veg, and that's fine too, but you just can't expect that structure, um, that veg structure to be gained in such a short period of time. 
It just means you'd have to populate more plants inside your room to be able to have that same kind of canopy, right? Uh, but I just, we, we, we call the way we um, uh, structure our plants just like ice sculpting, where we're sculpting from the bottom, from the top, we're topping, and it looks like a statue with really strong branches that gives us that nice foundation. That's how we enjoy growing. And um, that's, that's what we do at Purple Farm, so. Yeah, another just good reminder again of the, the importance of observation and knowing, knowing your own goals and your own visions. Um, Bernard, I wanted to go back. Uh, I know the word stressor came up a little bit ago. Um, could you just talk about the interplay between mycorrhizae and other nutrients that, that a grower may already be using, whether it's a different mix that they came up with on their own or what have you? Um, is there any, uh, anything that a grower should keep in mind with specific nutrients? The, uh, just maybe the, uh, you know, we've tested connect with many uh, nutrient lines, nothing to worry there. This, the only thing we see or, or we, we, um, we provide to the market is to, uh, to slow down or drop down a little bit in the initial days of doing the connection or the, 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 the transplanting with the, the connect, for example, is to lower down the phosphorus level um, anywhere from 20 ppm and lower just for that couple of days. It doesn't it doesn't really, uh, you know, it won't kill the mycorrhizae, but it will kind of not give the chance or not enable it to, to, to pick on quicker if there's too much phosphorus at that initial stage. But other than that, I mean, mycorrhizae is an add-on, um, you know, even the effects that Mitch was mentioning, it's, it, you know, it's a, a, it's a very, really fine hair, what we call the hyphae. So that hyphae will for sure uptake way more nutrient. I would guess, you know, what Mitch was saying earlier, I mean, that's a direct effect of the, the mycorrhizae because you're exploring all your container, all your growing media that were necessarily just the main root system wouldn't uh, be able to access. But because you have all more of that horizon, horizontal uh, area, surface area, you're able to access many parts of the, of the growing media. People that are transplanting anyways at the beginning shouldn't be using a full line of fertilizer on their first transplant, right? It's yeah. shocking to the plant. So typically, the first transplant wouldn't have a full fertilizer, um, you know, feed anyways, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we are going to get to audience questions shortly, so I'll just remind everyone that uh, the Q and A box is there at the bottom of your screen. I know we've got a bunch coming in already, and we'll get to those shortly. Uh, we have been talking, um, of course, about uh, just flour and mass in general. Uh, but I know we have some product manufacturers and processors in the audience and just wanted to touch on that real quick. And this can go to, to anyone really, maybe Bernard. Um, is everything that we're talking about here, does this also apply if your end goal is ultimately an extracted product? Yeah, same thing. I, actually, it's, it, it even helps. It's not just the flower. If you're going to have a better output of the flower to do, for example, extraction, you're going to benefit as well that return investment. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we did some some outdoor trials or outdoor demonstration where the people were doing extraction, guaranteeing if you're able to elevate your, your terpenes, your, your cannabinoids, well, you're gonna have that same elevation and give you more at the end for your, your end result product, if it's oil, for example. For, so yes, absolutely, that will help. Because if you, the quality of your input can be better, you know, the quality of the end product for any type of extraction, extraction of, or concentrate is going to be higher as well. You have, of course, some losses in any processes, but if you are able to consistently have higher cannabinoids, higher terpenes, and even more biomass to fuel your extraction process, of course, you're going to benefit uh, from, from all of that. Absolutely. And then just before getting to audience Q&A here, um, this, this question might bring us back to the beginning in a way, but just in terms of the overall marketplace and um, of course, ProMix Connect being what we're talking about here, what should growers be looking for when assessing a mycorrhizae product? And I know that there are a few key words that we've returned to throughout this conversation so far, um, but maybe Matthias or Bernard, um, just with the whole marketplace out there, what should growers look for? What should they stay away from? Uh, well, the first thing, like like you said, it came back to viability, right? So looking for a product that is focused on viable spores instead maybe of propagals. Uh, after that, there's the concentration, you know, of course, higher the concentration, uh, but there's the chances of success uh, is, is gonna be. 
Uh, but after that, also you need to look at behind the packaging. You know, uh, if you have like a ton of type of mycorrhizae uh, behind it, a ton of type of active ingredients, uh, sometimes it tell a story that the person who's producing it is not really in sync with all this process and production and formulation. So we know at Premier we have the glumus and triredices that perform well. So we only have that species at a high concentration uh, because we know that's the one providing the best benefit at the end of the day for a grower. Uh, and sometimes also any type of mycorrhizae product uh, in liquid form uh, that aren't kept at four degrees, uh, that should tell you that maybe the viability isn't really, really good. Yeah, and I will add also, like all the, the, the aseptic conditions, you don't want to bring anything that could, you know, bring disease or bring something to your plant. So as, being aseptic, being in a clean, free environment, um, which the, the way we produce is, is directly that. Um, the, the, I would say the carrier, the carrier that you're bringing your mycorrhizae is as important as the mycorrhizae itself. If you're bringing something that will not enable the, the, the spore to, to survive, that will have an effect because you're bringing basically nothing at the end. Um, so the carrier, the, the cleanness of the, 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 the mycorrhiza itself, and a little bit like my Tsias mentioned, sometimes we, you know, if, if the more is not the better, sometimes it's even, it competes, you know, you want something, if you buy mycorrhiza for mycorrhiza, you make sure that that's what you're bringing to your crop and it's, it's alive. So it's not just a cocktail of different things that you don't necessarily know what's giving you the outcome, if it does giving you an outcome at the end. And just to complete on that, because it's something that we pretty much everybody do, but a lot of people that shop for mycorrhizae products are going to look at the weight, you know, the weight and the price. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're not paying for a carrier. You're not paying for a powder. You're paying for mycorrhizae. And the value behind a mycorrhizae product is the cost, the, the viability and the spores. So that those are the two factors that you need to look for. Uh, so the most affordable product is the one having the highest concentration and the highest viability at the end of the day. Excellent. Um, we are going to sort of transition over to an audience Q&A at this point. Real quick, though, I do want to put up uh, a poll um, for the audience as we're heading into this portion of the presentation, just to sort of get a quick sense from everyone. Um, now that we've defined mycorrhizae and um, gotten into some of the benefits just curious if the audience out there um, is already using products like this on, on their craft. So we're gonna leave this poll up for just a, a few seconds here. Um, while this is up, I was actually gonna ask Bernard sort of a question that followed up to the last one. In terms of storage, uh, room temperature is okay for this kind of product? Room temperature is, is perfectly fine. Uh, we try to avoid you know, high and very low. So really te room temperature is the best area. We even took, uh, you know, just in terms of quality, we also added to that when we shipped the product to the to the end grower, uh, you know, it's shipped in a bag, but the bag is even enclosed with a what we call kind of a thermal foil to avoid any trans any temperature uh, shock. So, I mean, we took the time to look at that as well at, at Premier there when we developed the uh, the offer as well. So, but back to your question, yes, room, room temperature Excellent. is perfectly fine. Perfect. Well, thanks everyone in the audience for um, providing your input on that quick little poll. Um, again, uh, a lot of you have added questions already. Please feel free to open that Q&A box at the bottom. I'm uh, going to start off with a, sort of a, a combination question here regarding aeroponics and hydroponics. And I know we talked about growing media earlier in this presentation, uh, but does a product like this work in that aeroponic or hydroponic setting? Uh, I, I would say it depends. Uh, purely aeroponic is a bit uh, I would not be sure because you know you don't have a physical structure where the plant, uh, the plant, uh, not the plant, but the hyphen network can develop itself. And in some type of setup of hydroponic, you also have a water flow that inhibit the, the spores to get attached to the root system. So it depends. If your water flow isn't that high, uh, you have a physical structure. It could in certain uh, situation, but it would not be my first recommendation in in that setup. And Eric, I just wanted to add on that, uh, you know, we, we get pretty often, you know, uh, growers or people, consumers asking us, like, can I just feed it on top? And we, you know, it, it needs to be close, right? It needs to be really close to the root system. So anywhere that you have kind of, you dilute it or it doesn't really is able to attach to the root system. So that's why, uh, you know, hydroponic is, is touchy because 
if you have a, a, a water floor, nutrient flow, I mean, the, my, the spore needs to stay there a few days. I mean, it really needs to connect, right? So, uh, so that's why even in the industry, we hear like people in drip lines and stuff like that. Yeah, but really the best option is really close to that root and giving it the chance to explore the, the spores, basically. Yeah, that was, not, that was gonna be another question. And I guess you sort of answered it there. The you know, question of whether this can be added to plants that are already started, whether already in the veg phase or already in bloom. Um, and I guess you sort of already began answering that, but uh, it, that's not really helpful. Would it be at that point? Uh, it, it would be depend uh, how long is your cycle because you know it's a couple of days it could be up to two weeks so one week to two weeks to get, get the symbiosis fully established and all the benefit of the mycorrhizae so if you're looking to harvest in a month of course the benefits not going to be as high as if you apply it at the beginning but again it's clearly uh, it, it's going to provide some things you're applying just not as much as if it's early in the cycle mm -hmm. Um, we have a question here just regarding, I suppose, uh, uh, ingredient list uh, with Promix Connect. Uh, are there any beneficial bacteria or other fungi species, kelp, amino acids, humic acid, anything like that in there? No, uh, the formulation is only pure uh, 6,000 viable spores and the carrier itself would connect, yeah. But the only we thing do, that however, can... uh, We do, oh, however, just to add on that, um, the, at ProMace on, on our growing media line, we do have what we call our bacillus. We do, we manufacture our own technologies in Cy Premier, Premier Tech. So, uh, you know, we have the 297, which we call the PTV 297, which is the mycorrhiza, but we also have the 180, which is our bacillus that we combine in our growing media option. For example, an HP, what we call HP plus, that's the combination of both uh, technologies together. Mm -hmm. And uh, to complete that mycorrhizae and any, not any type, but some type of bacillus really work well together because, again, you have the root system where the bacteria can uh, produce a biofilm, but having the extra IFI network, so uh, you have just more surface where uh, the bacteria can develop itself, so provide a bit more uh, stimulation to your plant. I know um, we've been talking a lot about uh, indoor um, cannabis production, uh, but we do have a question here regarding comparisons performance between outdoor and indoor. And this kind of goes back to, I guess, a growing media question as well, but uh, Bernard or Matthias, could you talk a bit about um, outdoor as well? Well, outdoor, we did a few uh, demos uh, throughout the last couple of years. Uh, I think I mentioned quick uh, earlier, but I mean, that's where we've seen the main, the most increase. I mean, we've seen uh, the last, the two last years, anywhere from 40 to 50% yield increase. I mean, it's, it's really, really, because a lot of times, you know, outdoor, for example, if you're going right into soil, you won't have, you know, you'll have a, a four inch pot or a four inch, you know, container and you'll go directly in the field. Some, some do that in the hemp, for example. Uh, so, I mean, it, it goes, you know, what, what, what the temperature with the environment, which is more harsh than being in an indoor facility. So that's where we've seen the best outcome. And, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, um, mycorrhizae, uh, it's a symbiosis, right? So the way the plant goes is the way the fungi is going to go. So it's going to help the plant any way it could. So higher the stress from the plant, higher the, the benefit of the mycorrhizae is going to be because you're going to try to help the plant as much as possible. So being outdoor, of course, temperature, lights, uh, fruits, everything is, uh, you know, most of the time to mother nature. So you're able to achieve, you know, higher yield, higher cannabinoids and terpenes, again, uh, much more outdoor than indoor, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Mitch, I know we were talking about pot size earlier, um, but just in, a, in another broader sense, um, as you get into the flower cycle, do you have to space the plants out a bit more or give them more room to account for more robust growth at that point? Funny enough, uh, yes, you do slightly because <laughs> the branches, you have more branch formations, the plant is more robust, so you end up having to shave uh, sometimes a few plants off of your tables because there's just so much veg growth in there. So yeah, not huge, but slightly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, products or um, maybe not specific products per se, but, uh, but anything that growers should be aware of that might hurt uh, the mycorrhizae? Anything that, uh, that should be red flags for growers? 
Uh, on the top of my head, I, I wouldn't say uh, there is because we test most of the product out there, most of the first line, most of the active ingredient out there. Uh, and any type of compounds usually that growers use, uh, it's such a, at a low concentration that is not going to kill the fungi. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say there's a, a product that is mostly used out there that you should look for. Um, we have a question I, here from, oh, I'm sorry. I think to add for good practice is don't overfeed at the beginning and don't use an abundance of fertilizer on your first transplant, you know, to just give the mycorrhizae the easiest time uh, to transition and work and germinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from a, a grower um, who's writing, at our cannabis grow, we're currently using sub-irrigation with mycorrhizae one time per week for six inch veg cubes. Uh, what would some of the best practices be uh, given given that rhythm? Would adding to the transplant be increasingly beneficial? And what would that process look like? I'm not sure if I understand correctly. The feed from the bottom uh, cube of six six inches? Six inch veg cubes, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, again, the only issue that I would see there uh, is if you're feeding from the bottom and the mycorrhizae is in suspension in your water, the only problem is the proximity with the roots again. Uh, so I would say that the easiest way would be to apply it directly under your roots before going into the six inch cube. That would be the way to go if you want to maximize benefit with the mycorrhizae. It still could work at some point, but you know, you're not getting the best result out of that technique, I would say. Maybe just an add on to, I mean, if you are to do that, I mean, make sure like in terms of filters, everything is very clean, that it, there's no clog. I mean, it, you're trying to pass spores, right? You have to go through the line and get those spores to the root. So, I mean, the cleaner the, the, cleaner the area to, 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 to go, I mean, that's gonna help the mycorrhizae at least to flow together. Um, we have a question here just regarding uh, photosynthesis. Um, does the plant need to um, sort of perform more photosynthesis to develop the sugars to support the excess mycorrhizae? Is there any sort of calculation that needs to be taken into account there with uh, just the photosynthesis process? We've never looked at that. So, but if you, uh, for for my end, I would say uh, that the mycorrhizae concentrate itself on the roots, right? So after that, any Thing that the plant needs to do to compensate for the more uptake of nutrient uh, it had to do. But I don't know, we've never measured the impact on uh, phytosynthesis in itself uh, for the application of mycorrhizae. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here regarding um, uh, just heavy metals and other compliance testing in general. Uh, are there any things that growers should need to look out for when, uh, when using uh, Promix Connect when, when it comes to that heavy metal testing down the line? So it's a good question and we didn't mention it, but uh, two things actually on a on our end uh, as a manufacturer, we assure that we have all the certificate of analysis when we pro that we're able to provide the market on, upon demand. So uh, Connect is produced by small batches. So we have a lot number, we have a manufacturing date. We're able to have all the, uh, all the, uh, Salmonellas, uh, heavy metals are all tested. So we're able to provide that to the industry. On the second level is we also took, we didn't show you all the return, all the efficacy reports we've done with growers, but that is also part of the testing to make sure that we pass on all levels in terms of microbials. Uh, we did it you know, many times with Mitch as well. So uh, guaranteed everything is, is, is okay on the initial end, but at the final end as well uh, with, the, with the addition of uh, connect. I'm mm -hmm. um, going to get into two sort of outdoor related questions here. I know we've touched on this a little bit, um, but are there any maybe long-term benefits to the soil in an outdoor environment, even from just a, a single application of something like ProMix Connect? Are there um, long after the production cycle, are there uh, long-term benefits? Yeah, we, uh, it usually stays there actually. You know, we see it a lot of times, uh, in agriculture, it's the same concept. I mean, they'll, they'll use mycorrhizae just to enhance the soil, to enrich the soil itself. And yes, we can see we've tested that in uh, more on the ag side, but uh, we tested that many times, even three, four, five years, the mycorrhizae, myco mycorrhizae is still present. The only thing in different cannabis, well, usually you grow your plant, you know, if it's outdoor, yes, but if it's indoor, usually you grow your plant, the plant is 
at the end and then you get rid of the, the, the media and then you have to start back. So that's kind of why. Yeah. And we do, don't talk about it that much because, uh, of course, most of the, the the cannabis is grown indoor and the greenhouses in a pot. But uh, mycorrhizae is renowned for helping the structure of the soil in the long run. Excellent. Um, sort of similar. I know that we've touched on hemp in passing, uh, but we do have a question regarding autoflower, hemp CBD varieties. And I was just going to lump this into hemp in general. Again, of course, we're talking about cannabis here and, and hemp is cannabis and there's just a legal distinction. But with those hemp plants that maybe even are grown for, it could be fiber or grain or with this, uh, this audience member, autoflower hemp CBD varieties, um, anything different there? Uh, can, this product can be used for those varieties as well. Yeah, the, the only difference we brought it to the hemp market is the application mode. Uh, for example, in hemp, a lot of times they'll use a, a for example, a transplanter hauled by a tractor uh, we just changed the application mode to be able to, uh, you know, have the, far the farmer, the grower be able to access and, and put it in the field. So that's the only difference. It's the way it's applicated. We, you know, we keep it, you need to really keep it in suspension. You know, you're using sometimes some reservoirs. Uh, so it really needs to be uh, al always in, in movement. I mean, you don't want the spores to trickle down to the end. Uh, some, some we do it that way. We've seen in hemp the other way around. They do it as they do in an indoor facility so we'll use that just a little re-technique like we mentioned earlier and we'll use it that way as well so and and sometimes i hear in the hemp industry they fear to get uh, hot hemp because uh, they're using mycorrhizae because you're gonna end up with more cannabinoids but at the end of the day if you have selected the right uh, genetics you're not supposed to you know uh, have the, the mycorrhizae is going to help the plant achieve the best it can depending on its genetics. So if you have the right genetics, you're not supposed to produce as much THC. So you're not gonna end up with more THC, you're gonna end up with more CBD. Uh, yeah, very good point there. Um, we have a question, uh, again, going back to growing media here with rock wool cubes. Um, can you just describe the transplant application process uh, with rock wool cubes um, specifically? Is, is it gonna be similar to uh, that video earlier? Same thing. It's the same process. Uh, you know, usually they have like two or three transitions. So from your 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 small cube, you'll go through your six inch uh, rock wool rock wool uh, square. Uh, you see it on the uh, on the right there. So it's pretty much the same application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then another uh, outdoor soil related question, uh, and this just goes back to application as well, but. Can the soil be saturated in mycorrhizae or um, does it really need to follow the, the application process that you're talking about here? Well, like, and it's a good question. We get a lot of questions sometimes, you know, when we sell it, for example, our Bella Promix HP with mycorrhizae, you know, why would I add more mycorrhizae? It's in the bill. It's the same glomus. It's the same strain that we pr reproduce at Premier. Uh, it goes back again. It's, you want it earlier quicker, faster. So it really goes down to, to the time. So you could, but at the end, you're trying to achieve what we discussed for the last half hour to really make sure that it's able to pick it up quick. So, uh, and, and it's also calculating how much rate you want to add in. I mean, you can formulate, that's why, for example, in the HP plus, which it, or HP mycorrhizae, it's nice because it's all across in the, in the growing media, but Again, for us, it was the main goal is to get achieve results quick. That's why we bring it right away to the root system. Yeah. Well, Bernard, Matthias, and Mitch, I want to thank you for this conversation. I think we covered a lot of really great ground. It's a, it's a super interesting topic. And um, I think uh, between uh, some of the slides and the, the conversation we had, we, uh, we got through a lot of really informative subjects here. Um, I also, of course, want to thank the audience for attending today, and I know we had a few of these questions in the Q&A box. Uh, yes, we will be uh, posting this webinar on CannabisBusinessTimes.com, and we'll be distributing it to everybody who registered via email in the coming days. So thank you all for being here, and again, Bernard, Matthias, and Mitch, and the whole Premier, the whole Premier Tech team, uh, thank you so much for being here. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.